Hey, Fly Tires, how you doing today? Welcome to Fly Tying Monday. Um, I have bad news for you. Well, there's bad news and there's good news. The bad news is that Julie is not here today. She's under the weather. But Tanner is here. Say hi, Tanner. Hello. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I put you on. I, I uh, jumped the gun on you there. So Tanner is going to be... Um, while I'm tying, Tanner is going to be answering your questions or posting links or whatever. And if you have never been to Fly Tying Monday, welcome. This is where we, we tie a fly live and uh, I make mistakes and you laugh at me. And today's fly is a fairly long one and it's not terribly difficult but it is involved so uh i'm probably going to start fairly quickly uh, tying just because it's it's going to take a while <laughs> and what we're tying today is a changer bugger and a changer bugger is merely is sort of sort of a woolly bugger with uh, articulated an articulated body and i'll show you this way so that it swings back and forth and it has the hook in the rear the hook is back here in the rear so that you don't have to use two hooks i don't like putting two hooks on articulated flies let me get that to focus come on focus uh, so it has a hook in the back and it has, uh, lead eyes or, uh, solid dumbbell eyes in the front and a bunch of articulated shanks and some rubber legs. It's a very, very wiggly fly has lots of action in the water. I mean, woolly buggers by themselves have, uh, have good action. And this has even more action because it's articulated. So uh, it, it does take some time to tie those different body segments, but it's not that difficult. A lot of people are um, are uh, put off or intimidated by tying game changer type flies because they have multiple segments. Um, uh, but you shouldn't be because uh, as long as you have the right materials, it's not it's not that bad, and it's just it just takes time. And you want to use a relatively heavy tippet on these flies because you got a lot invested in them. So um, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, use a loop knot. I like to use a loop knot with these flies and use a relatively heavy tippet because you're going to be moving the fly anyway. And once when you're fishing a fly under action, you don't have to worry about light tippets. So, you know, 2X, 1X, even OX uh, for these flies with a loop knot um they're they're uh, a little more difficult to cast as well because they're they're longer and they're air resistant so you're going to want a heavy tippet a relatively short heavy tippet anyways on these flies and you can use this changer bugger for nearly everything from small mouth to large mouth to uh larger carp uh, it's a great trout fly it's a really good small mouth bass fly you can use them in salt water. Uh, you can you can use them for near for pike. Make a make a bigger, longer one for pike. And don't get hung up on the colors I'm using here. I like tan streamers. I use a lot of tan streamers because sculpins are kind of tannish. But you can tie this in any color. And um, as we go through, I'll I'll make recommendations for some some substitutes. Uh, for some of the materials, but they're, they are great, great flies. They really are. They're developed by a guy named Blaine Chocolate, who if you're interested in game changers, uh, this is Blaine's book. And although it doesn't specifically have a changer bugger um, in it, changer bugger is, is kind of a simplified uh, version of his feather game changer. Uh, but Blaine is a one of the most brilliant fly designers of our time, and um, 
this is this fly is uh, inspired by him. It was first shown to me by my fishing buddy Drew Price, who I fish with a lot on Lake Champlain, and he uses it for multiple species. He uses it for all kinds of of fish. Um, one of the things you want you want to remember with this fly is that uh, your your hook is not always in a, in in a straight line with the eye of the hook where you're attached. So you want to let the fish take this and you want to strip strike it, but it's probably a good idea to give it an extra after, after the fish is, is on the hook uh, because, because you don't have as, as direct a connection. So you may have to do a little bit of extra jab to keep the fly in the fish. Um, I'm using a, uh, I'll show you the hook in a minute. I'm using a, a very sharp barbless uh, carp hook for the trailing hook. You can use any, you can use any short shank, uh, very short shank, very sharp uh, hook on this fly. So anyway, without further ado, if we don't have any questions, uh, let's start. And uh, the question about the archived, it's all, it'll also be in our uh, YouTube, uh, Tom's Tips uh, playlist in our YouTube uh, on our YouTube channel, on the Orvis YouTube channel. Okay, so let's start. And uh, if you have any questions, Tanner will yell them out to me as we go. So I'm going to start with this hook from Fulling Mill. Uh, it's called the Bonio Carp Hook. And uh, Drew turned me on to this hook. It's... Uh, it's a short shank, heavy duty, barbless hook. I'll put it in the vise; you can see it better. By the way, uh, this uh, vise I'm using is a special game changer vise from Renzetti. If you tie a lot of game changers, um, you know it's interchangeable with the other uh, Renzetti heads on their. Um, I uh, forgot what series this is, but they're they're basic they're basic series, um, and you'll see how this how this helps help tie this particular fly. So this is that, and it'll hold regular hooks as well. You don't have to just tie game changers, but it's great for great for those shanks. So this is that Bonio carp hook. It's got a curved curved in. I think they call it a spear point. Very very sharp. Uh, very heavy short chain cook. And I am using size 60 tan thread. You can use any, any color that blends with the body. I'm going to just start my thread as normal on the hook. And I'm going to cover the hook shank back to the bend with thread. You could use 6 0, you could even use 3 0 for bigger flies. And then, what if you're going to tie a lot of these feather changers? One of the things that I would highly recommend are these soft hackle marabou patches. This one comes from Hairline. And what it gives you is not only the feathers to tie the body of this thing, but it also gives you that uh, grizzly marabou up here at the top. And if you look behind, you can see underneath there's lots of that that little that uh, chickaboo or uh, grizzly marabou. So I'm going to start by grabbing a couple of these grizzly marabou feathers for the tail. And I'm going to look for a couple that are nice and nice and fluffy. I don't like those. I'm going to turn it over. Um, what kind of vice are you using? It's a Renzetti. It's a Renzetti with the game changer jaws. So I'm going to pick one. To, you could just two to four on this fly. So now I've got two of those 
those grizzly marabou feathers and I'm going to lay them on top of each other. Blocking my light. Lay them on top of each other. And I want this, these feathers to be a little bit longer than the bend of the hook. Maybe about that long, just so you got a little wiggly stuff that comes out. And I'm going to hold it at my tie-in point and just cut them off a little bit, be a little bit uh, behind the eye. And then I'm going to wet them. Just makes marabou easier to work with. I'm, I just wet the butt ends of this. Make sure they're lined up. Tie them in tightly, about three turns, and then move forward. And it looks like I need a little trim again here. I'll trim that off. Tom, Chris asks, could a first-time tire have a go at this, or would there be a better novice fly to try first? I would not start with this as a first-time tire. Uh, it's not that it's that difficult, but there's some steps where you have to kind of manipulate things and it gets a little tricky. So I would start, if you're a first time tire, I would start with a standard woolly bugger. You can find the pattern, uh, anywhere. <laughs> and I would start with a standard woolly bugger instead of this changer bugger. Okay. So the next thing I am going to do is tie some body material in. And I'm using uh, Chocolate's Finesse Body Chenille, which is what he uses for his smaller game changers. It looks kind of like hackle, it's sparkly. And cut off about a you know, three or four inch piece. That'll, that'll tie all of your segments in this, in this fly. And then I'm going to... Take one end of it and just pluck the fibers so that I have that core exposed. So it looks like that. And then I'm going to tie this. And you could use probably use Estaz or any kind of sparkly body material. I'm going to tie in that core. And I'm only going to take about two turns of this. And you can fold this. So you want to pull it, pull it back so that it all comes to one side and fold it over itself, starting right at the base of that tail. And two or maybe even three on this first segment. And just kind of preen it back as you wind it and tie it off. A couple of turns. And then put that aside and you'll use that for your other body segments. And then I'm going to stroke all this stuff back and come back on it a little bit so it sweeps back a little bit because folding this stuff doesn't always doesn't always work terribly well. And there you go. Now I'm going to take <clears throat> uh, some rubber legs. I like these barred and speckled crazy legs. Um, silly legs will work. Any, any old rubber legs will work, whatever you like. And I'm going to need four of them. So I'm going to cut four or five of them now from the, from the bunch there. So I have them ready for them myself. And take one. <clears throat> and how long you make these rubber legs is up to you. I like it to be 
about the length of the tail, maybe a hair longer, and place it against the near side. Take a couple turns. And then usually I turn my vise and take a turn on the far side and then line it up with the the medial part of the hook shank so that it so that it lays back along the shank and then you want to trim that <clears throat> far leg about the same length as the near one and then wind back, <clears throat> excuse me, wind back a little bit on those legs. Make sure they're in place. Make sure they're where you want them. Along the sides. And <clears throat> now I'm going to come in. The nice thing about these, these, uh, Grizzly hand capes is that you can get uh, different size feathers. So you can kind of, as you move up the fly, you can use a bigger feather as you go along. So I'm going to start with a short, short one from the bottom. The bigger ones with the longer fibers are going to be toward the top of the cape. So I'm going to take this shorter feather and I'm going to pull it back from the tip a little bit exposing just the tip and I'm going to cut along the central stem and then cut it shorter so I'm left with a little fuzzy fuzzy nib there that'll make it easier to tie in without coming out so you can see that little little nib that I made and I'll tie that in nice and secure. You don't want that hackle coming out. And I'll come forward almost to the eye. And then the rest of the shank is going to be hackle. So you want to fold this so it folds back. So you hold it upright and you preen the fibers back. You can even wet them a little bit, pinch them. And then as you wind, this feather is going to want to twist. So you have to kind of keep retwisting it to get those fibers to sweep back. And sometimes it gets a little tricky, like this one is not behaving for me at all. But you want to try to fold those fibers so they lay back. And this, is, this one's really not behaving for me. but we'll do the best we can. And you're gonna inch your way forward. And see how that's twisting on me. And I have to keep retwisting the feather as I wind it. It's got a fairly thick stem for a saddle hackle. That's a problem with this particular feather. But it's laying in there okay. Also a little bit hard to get in here with this camera as, as usual when you're tying. Tom, Tim asks, how do you fish this fly? Do you de dead drift it or do you twitch it? You fish it any way you damn well please because it'll work always. You could dead drift it. You can twitch it. You can make short strips, long strips. You can crawl it along the bottom. The fish will tell you what they want. You have to experiment. There are no, there are no uh, givens or strict rules in fly fishing in particular. And then I'm going to make a nice little head here. Make sure that you don't have anything in the eye. 
So there's your first segment done. And I'm going to whip finish. And I'm going to put a little head cement on there because those threads are exposed. And this is a place I really like this water-based head cement. I'll show you why. So I just dab this all over the head and all over the eye, right? I've completely filled that eye with cement. See how that's completely filled with cement? And with this water-based head cement, you just take a piece of paper towel and you touch it to there. And boom, it's clear. So you've got the whole head and, and the eye coated with cement, but there's nothing, there's nothing in the eye. So one of the reasons I like that water-based head cement. Now, very important next step is to take a little piece of foam or a pencil eraser or a piece of putty or something and just cut and just get a little piece because you want to cover that hook point. So I just cut a piece of scrap foam there. Um, when you're tying the rest of this fly, you're going to be preening that hackle back. And this point is really sharp. So what I'm just going to do is put that piece of foam on there to protect my fingers. Because believe me, if you don't do this, you will be sorry. You will poke yourself. Okay, so now I'm going to take a couple of shanks. And you could put as many of these little shanks in there as you want. I'm going to... Hey, Tom. Yeah. Philip wants to know if you have any advice on head cement. No. Use whatever, use whatever you like. They all work. I use water-based. I use the standard deep penetrating. I use super glue sometimes. It depends on depends on uh, what you're doing. They all work. It, all it's doing is sealing, sealing the threads so that they don't unravel. And they, they all work well. Super glue, you know, if you super glue is kind of white, dries kind of whitish, so it's not really pretty. Um, in that case, I'll use a glossy head cement, but you know, any kind of waterproof head cement will, will work fine. So these are, I think these are like nine or 10 millimeter. They're fairly short little shanks. And for this first one, I'm going to open, I'm just going to pry it open a little bit with my thumbnail because sometimes it's hard to get it in in that that hook so i'm just going to open open up that gap just a little bit and you could buy these shanks from orvis or wherever you get fly tying materials and i'm going to take that shank and i'm going to try to get it there i went in so i'm going to put it in that hook and then I'm going to move the shank into the vise. This is why I like this, this um, changer vise because it allows you to work with shanks really easily. And then you're going to start your thread on here. And make sure that you, uh, the eyes on these shanks are sometimes open. They can cut your thread. So be careful when you first start out. Kind of. Hey, Tom, check your camera. Oh. Sorry about that. Didn't switch. You okay now? We good? We good, Tanner? Yep. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. And then you're going to come back once you start your thread and you're going to close that shank, go back and forth. And again, there might be a sharp edge there, so be careful. And you want to wind back and forth because you're going to try to build it up a little bit on this 
on this uh, piece here, this eye, and it's, it gets a little tricky. So come up about halfway onto that uh, segment, and you're going to take your um, body material again, and you're going to tie that in. And here you only want about two turns. So I'm going to take two turns. One, two, tie it off. Trim it. Preen it back. This is why you want it, that hook covered. Wind back over it. Give it. Make yourself a nice smooth base. You don't have to worry about, you can use a lot of wraps in this fly. And then you're going to tie in another rubber leg, same way you did the first one. I like to make the second one like go to like half the length the midpoint of the rubber leg behind it you can make them whatever length you want i don't know if there's any any rule or any anything special and take a couple turns there move back in place push this over the top secure that one on the far side and then come back against those two rubber legs and then just make sure they're sticking out to the side where you want them. Trim that far leg to about the same length as the near leg. And now you're going to wind another hackle. So we're going to grab another hackle, and this time I'm going to come further up. Tom, James is asking, what's the purpose of the shank? Oh, uh, the shank is to make the fly wiggle. It makes it articulated. I'm going to take a, a wider feather from higher up on the cape and do the same thing. Hold the tip. Strip it back, cut it, tie it in. This is where it gets fussy, I'm trying to cram all this stuff. Under this fairly short shank. And again, folding that feather and just manipulating it so that it lays back. And working gradually forward, but these turns should be really tight to each other. You want to pack in as much hackle as you can in here before you get to the eye. You can see I'm just preening and folding that. And that's about all the turns I'm gonna get. I could, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mess with fire and take another turn. And then tie this off. Trim it. Oh, I got lucky. Make a nice secure head there. Whip finish. You can see why. People don't like to lose these flies. Got 
drop a super glue, head cement, whatever you want on there. And again, I'm gonna I'm gonna go all over that eye because I can just blot it clear. And yeah, there's a couple things sticking in there, but they're not gonna matter. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my other little shank. And while this is while this piece is still in the vise. I'm going to slide this baby in there if I can get it. Sometimes you have to open these up a little bit. I'm going to open this up a little bit with my thumbnail. You could stick a screwdriver in there, too, if you want. Doesn't usually, you don't usually need to open them up that much. Let's see if I can get it in now. Tom, are both shanks the same size? Yeah, these are both the same size. And they're little ones. Then I'm going to put this, put this in there. And, you know, you can experiment with different, I mean, Blaine Chocolate uses like six or seven shanks on some of his flies. I, I don't have the patience. And I think you get enough, I think you get enough wiggle with, I'm going to actually have uh, three of them in here before I'm done, plus the hook. And then I'm going to do the same thing. Closing up that, that connection. Coming way up on there. And take my body material. Tie it in. So this gets, you know, you get, to, you get doing six or seven of these and it gets kind of repetitive. <laughs> I just don't... I just, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to do six or seven segments. It's just too much. Two turns here again. Two turns of that body chenille. Preen it back. Wind over it so it sweeps back a little bit more. And so you have a little more room. Now you could put longer shanks in here if you want, but I think the shorter ones give you more wiggle. And we want wiggle, right? Right, Tanner? We want wiggle in this sucker. That's a little hot. Absolutely. That's a little uh, hot. James asks, he, he says he's never fished with any articulated flies before, but he's looking to tie a few of them. Yeah. Do you see the articulation... Uh, like this working better overall compared to a standard woolly bugger in a similar size or color? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it seems to. What is it worth all the trouble? I don't know, but uh, I've had, uh, I've gone through a pool with a standard woolly bugger and then gone through with a, one of these and, and had fish eat that didn't eat on the first pass. So, I think they like it. So I'm going to tie in a rubber leg, you know, kind of halfway to that to that one behind it. But you have to experiment. You know, right? I, I can't. I don't. I don't have any. I don't have any uh, sure things for you, because there's no such thing as a sure thing in uh, in fishing or fly tying. So I'm just winding that other rubber leg on the other side and I'll manipulate it to make sure it's going along the other side. Probably doesn't even matter what direction they go because all you're looking for is a lot of wiggle here. And then I'm gonna cut that one off. Make sure I cut the right one. 
about the same length as the one on this side. I got any fuzzies in the hook eye, I'll clean them out. Now I'm gonna get a slightly bigger feather. I'm gonna come up a little higher. Oops. I'm gonna come up a little higher on that cape and find a nice full wide one. I tied a bunch of these and I'm kind of running out of good feathers up here. There's one. So now I've got a little bit bigger feather. I'm gonna do the same thing. Nip it, nip the tip off. Cut that little fuzzy. That's like that. And tie that little nib and in. And so this one's a little bit longer, so we're kind of, you know, kind of building a taper in this fly. Tie it off. Trim it. Stroke any of those fibers back that stick forward. Wind a little head. And you know, if you, there's a real tendency to get stuff in the eye. So what you can do, I'm gonna whip finish this first. What you can do is if it really bothers you or there's so much stuff in the eye that you think it might affect the articulation, you can take cauterizing tool and very carefully just hit those fibers. Be careful you don't hit your thread. You got to really steady your hand for this. And that'll clean that'll clean that eye out for you. Cauterizing tool is really handy. If you uh, if you get a cauterizing tool, get one with uh, that you can replace the batteries. And some of them have a permanent battery and Oh, I lost my, I lost my little piece of foam. Uh, you don't, you want the ones where you can change the batteries in it because otherwise you'll be throwing away a, a lot of plastic. Okay. Um, Jeffrey wants to know would different sizes of polar chenille work if you don't have the finesse changer chenille? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And Mac asked, uh, what size hook is it? Size eight, short shank. Now I'm going to come back to my shanks. And if you tie any of these at all, you want to, you know, you want to get one of these uh, selections of shanks because they go quickly, as you can see. And now I'm going to take a little bit longer one. I think this is maybe a, a 15, 15 uh, millimeter shank, but a little bit longer than the ones I used on the body. And you don't have to use that exact, that exact size, but you want one just, Again, a little bit longer than because you're going to put some eyes on this front piece. And then I'm going to shove that in there like so. Move it back. Secure my. That was smart. I could probably figure out something. Tim Flagler, I'm sure, has a tool that will hold that in place. I'm sure he has one. 
Tom Bryan asks, is it better to have the hook at the end of the fly rather than the tail? What's the hook? What's the hookup rate with the hook at the tail versus the hook at the head? I don't know how you would ever. I don't know how you would ever determine what that is because every day is different. Every fish is different and the way they hit the fly is different. There's, there's no way to determine that. So yeah, you can put the hook up in the front if you want. It will change the action of the fly slightly, maybe, maybe even for the better, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And I don't think anyone could ever uh, determine it because there's too many variables involved. It's a, you know, you're, you're dealing with a natural creature that has moods, but you could try it both ways. Absolutely. Try it both ways. So I'm going to start that thread. I'm going to come back just like I did before. Go back and forth a couple of times. And this, you want to make sure that that eye is sealed with thread because um, th they, they sometimes don't close them completely and uh, that'll cut your tippet. So in this last one, you really want to make sure that that eye is sealed. All right, now before I tie my body in, I'm going to put my eyes on here. And you want to come back to a little bit forward of the midpoint, not much. And I'm going to take a drop of super glue, as I usually do with weighted eyes, just one little drop. Put my lead eyes or solid metal eyes on top of there. Go crosswise first. A bunch of turns. I'll turn it so you can see it, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna center that and go crosswise the other way. Get those lined up, and you wanna be fairly generous with your thread here. Want to have have those securely in place, and then you go around the base with really tight turns to lock that in place. Your, your goal here is if you, if you do this and the eyes don't move, don't wiggle, then you're good. Because those eyes can wiggle, uh, they can move out of place after you catch a fish or after you cast for a few times. And as you can see, this is gonna be the bottom of my fly and my hook is down. So when this fly fishes, the hook is going to be pointing up, um, which will keep it from, uh, you know, keep it from snagging on the bottom a bit for you. Then I'm going to go and really do the same, pretty much the same thing. I'm going to take my Estes or my Finesse changer material. What is this stuff called? I forgot what it's called. I can't find it. Forgot what it's called. Finesse. I think it's finesse changer material. <laughs> and I'm going to tie that in. Couple of turns. One. Two. Tie it in, a couple of tight turns, snip it, preen it back as best you can. Wind back over it so that it sweeps back a little bit. Another set of rubber legs, if you want. And I'll make this, you know, yeah, I'll make it as long. I'll make it the same length. Make it equal length as that middle one. Add a little extra wiggle to it. And then put it on the other side. Take a couple turns to get it over on that side. Roll it up. 
Line it up. Oops. Line it up. Those look like they're both coming out the same way. Cut it. Yeah, those are a little longer. That's okay. We'll add to the wiggle. And then now I'm going to go and find my very biggest, widest uh, piece of soft hackle, saddle hackle. I'm going to come way up to the top and take one of these great big honkers here. Biggest one you can find on your, on your cape. And do the same thing. Make sure I was on the right camera. Snip it. Shorten it up a little bit. Oh, I, no, I didn't know. I thought I forgot my rubber legs, but I didn't. Sometimes I forget rubber legs on a segment. And you know what? That's okay. The fish aren't going to know. Who knows? Who, Tom, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Adrian yeah. asks, why do you add eyes to a fly? Do the fish see the eyes or is it just to make it look pretty? I think it's both. I, I think, well, in this case, it's weight because these flies, I didn't change cameras. These flies are heavy. You want it to be heavy. You want it to get down. Um, Otherwise, it'll it'll kind of be neutrally buoyant, and you want it you want it to be pretty deep. So, uh, there are people that believe that that eyes uh, are important for the fish catching qualities, and they make the fly look pretty, and also uh, they add weight. In this case, so all of the above. I think. Who knows? I don't know. Adam asks, do these work well for bonefish or perhaps redfish? I think they'd work well for I think they'd work well for redfish. I have not tried them on redfish or bonefish. I think for a larger bo larger bonefish do eat bait fish. Um, this is a pretty large fly, even if you tie a small one. This is a pretty large fly for a bonefish. Uh, but you know, especially in like Belize or Mexico, but for Florida or Bahamian bonefish, yeah, it would probably work. They do, they do eat a fair number of bait fish, especially the big bonefish. So I've got as much hackles I can cram in there. I tie that off. This wouldn't be my first choice for bonefish. Redfish, yeah, I think it would work well. And then I'm going to preen those back. And then I'm going to come forward in front of the eyes. And now I'm going to take another small hackle. So that you got you got kind of a, a taper to the front, and then you're going to taper down toward the head of your fly. So now I'm going to come and come in here and get a smaller hackle. For the head. Tom Jeffrey asks, depending on the water depth, can you use this streamer with a floating line or primarily with an intermediate or sink tip line? All of the above. Depending on how deep the water is and where the fish where the fish are. I'd use it on all of them. I think this would be a really good fly swinging for steelhead too. I have not used it for that, but I'm going to try it this fall. Any bait fish fly can be used for almost any game fish. And this is a bait fish fly. Well, who knows what it is? Leech, crayfish, bait fish fly. Who knows what this thing is? It's just wiggly. It's a lure more than anything else. And now I'm going to fold this smaller hackle. I'm 
in front of those eyes. And again, you want to cram it in there if you can. Even, even to the point of winding back over itself, which you don't normally do with hacka like this, but I think it's okay in a fly like this where you're trying to get a lot of a lot of bulk in there. And then you're gonna you're definitely gonna have some hackle fibers and just preen those all back. Try to grab them all and go back over them. Form a nice head. Got a little hair in there, get rid of it. Whip finish. Drop a cement. And it's nice to use a, a very viscous, or not viscous, but a flowing head cement like that stuff uh, because it'll actually go back into the hackle. And that. Once you remove the point guard, is your, here, I'll back up a little bit so you can see it better. Hope I can get it all in there. There she is. Yeah, I'll back up a little more. There, now you can see the whole thing. So there is your changer bugger. And as you can see, it's got a lot of wiggle to it. A lot of action. Rubber legs, flowing hackle, a little bit of sparkle in there. A little bit of marabou on the end for that fluttering motion. Yeah, good fly. Really good fly. Now that's the changer bugger. Any other questions that I missed? And we made it in less than an hour. On water, which only allows for one hook, would you keep the trailing hook or primary hook? There is only one hook in this fly, Dry Fly Fisher 11. It's, ju it's just at the end of the fly. There is no, there is no front hook. The front is a, is a shank. So, yeah. Uh, There's one you know, from uh, Danny about the articulated fly. Would it tangle with all the segments? No, not really. Uh, the... That that chenille that you that you tie in front of it helps keep it from uh, keep it from going too extreme. But they seldom tangle these these kinds of flies, uh, just because there's there's nothing for it to tangle with. So, I mean, it might tangle occasionally, but no, it's not 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 usually a problem. Ed, did you tie along with me? You usually do. Do you think a skinny version would could be a marine worm? Yeah, I do. I do, Adam. I think that that for the uh, northeast cinder worm or the palolo worm in Florida, uh, a skinny version could be a very good imitation, particularly with a, a little foam or deer hair in there to keep it in the surface film. Yeah, 
There's a lot. I think there's a lot to be done with these uh, these shanks and these change your bodies. I think you're going to see. I think you're going to see a lot of cool stuff. And there's already a lot of cool stuff out there. Uh, you know, change your crayfish and change your bait fish and change your leeches. And, um, you know, there's when you're when you're trying to imitate a larger food form that's not an insect, uh, there's a lot of value to these. So uh, don't be afraid of, of using these shanks. They, yes, they are time consuming, um, but uh, they, they're, they're really a, they're really one of the most innovative types of flies that I have seen in my 50 plus years of tying flies. Uh, the game changers are really, real game changers. <laughs> um, they, they are truly innovative. And Blaine Chocolate has done a lot of, of, of research and uh, experimentation to get the flies to swim properly. So um, there, there's a lot to be done with this stuff. And it's, it's fun. It's fun. So experiment with it. Take your own favorite streamer pattern and try it as an articulated fly. And the thing that I really like about this is it only has one hook. You can put the hook in the front of the back, but you have an articulated fly without those two hooks. Um, two hooks can, can be dangerous sometimes with a big fish flopping and uh, can hook into the net and can be a pain in the butt. So I, I really like a, a single hook. Any other questions before I let you go? All right. Um, as we said, this will be on the Orvis Facebook page and um, it will be on the Orvis YouTube channel uh, under Tying with Tom in the next day or so. I have to go in and move it into that playlist, but it'll be it'll be on the Orvis YouTube page, YouTube page as soon as we as soon as we end the broadcast, it'll be saved to the Orvis YouTube page. So, yep, you can watch it again if you want. Um, and. I want to thank you all for coming in today. Those are some great questions that you had. No really tough questions. Um, and if you're new to uh, Monday Time, welcome. We like to have fun here. And I hope you did. So we will um, see you all. Let's see. I am not going to be tying again on Monday until the until September. What is it, Tanner? Next Monday. Next Monday, I'm going to be out, and the following Monday is Labor Day. So the Monday after that, uh, here I can tell you what it is. So don't look for me next Monday because I'm going to be off fishing. The next Monday tying is the, oops, that was in the wrong month. The next Monday tying is the 12th of September, and it's going to be the uh, wire caddis fly, caddis larva. All right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in, and uh, we will we'll see you see you soon. See you in September.